so much, John and Tyler and worship team for leading us in worship. Thank you again for joining us. I failed to mention earlier, if this is your first time to join us online, uh, we'd love for you to connect with us. If you could just text the letters GSFBC and your name to 94000. That's GSFBC and your name to 94000. We'd just like to know that you're with us and, uh, and thank you for joining us. You know, speaking of connecting, each week uh, I try to make contact with any first-time visitors. I typically just call and, and thank them for coming and answer any questions. And as I was thinking about that this week, I remembered a pastor uh, telling the story of making a contact to a family who had visited his church. He called the home, and when the phone stopped ringing, there was a whispered hello on the other end. And he said, well, hello, who is this? Jimmy? Well, Jimmy, how old are you? Four. Jimmy, could I speak to your mom? Well, she's busy. Could I speak to your dad? He's busy. Well, Jimmy, are there any other adults there at, at home with you right now? Well, the firemen and policemen are here. Could I speak to one of them? They're busy. Jimmy, what are all the adults doing? Looking for me? You know, we all want to know that someone is looking for us. We want to know that someone uh, cares about us. And that's what we're called to as a church. We are called to care. And I think it's important for us as a church. Geyer Springs is known as a church that cares for the community. But I think it's important from time to time to kind of check up and evaluate, hey, how are we doing at caring for our church family? And how are we doing at caring for the world around us? The body of Christ, and that's all of us individually, the body of Christ has been given the task of taking the gospel to the whole world. And that message isn't delivered in a, in a vacuum. It's not just words. That message is best delivered when it's wrapped in loving care to a world that is hurting. This morning, I want us to look in Mark chapter 2. It's a great example of the care and, and the touch that demonstrates the true gospel. Mark chapter 2, uh, in Jesus' ministry, uh, we're going to read about an, an event that occurred and see how that applies to us as a church today in caring for others. Mark chapter 2, I'm beginning in verse 1 and reading down through verse 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Now, in, in verses 1 and 2, what's happening is Jesus is at the peak of his popularity. Uh, word has traveled around the countryside about him. People had heard about his teaching, heard about his healings. And so a large crowd had gathered. Now, they were in a house. Um, likely Peter's house because of where they were located at this time. But typically in the Gospel of Mark, when you see a gathering happening in a house or a home, it, it's a church gathering. Uh, this was people coming together to hear Jesus teach. And you see it says here that the, the house, the church, if you will, was packed and overflowing. Literally, there were people standing outside the door in in the area around the house, standing outside, piled so deep that you couldn't even get close enough to hear. There were people sitting in the windows. The windows were open. There were no screens. People sitting in the windows, probably even people uh, hanging from the rafters. And it's an interesting picture when you think about it. Here's the church gathered, and it's so full of onlookers that someone in need can't 
get to Jesus. You know, that, that begs a question for us. When we gather as a church, are we here just, just to look? Are we here trying to lead people of Christ? Are we uh, spectators? We're, we're not called to be spectators. We're the search and rescue team. Well, in verse 3 and 4, you see that this paralytic was brought um, because they knew Jesus could heal four men. We don't know who these men were. These men are obscure. Their names are not mentioned. They remain obscure. We'll never know who they were, I guess, until uh, we get to heaven. The only thing we know about these men is they brought this man. Um, and it was an effort to bring this man. We assume they were neighbors, perhaps uh, friends. There had to be some degree of concern they had for this man, because think about it, a paralytic uh, lying on his mat uh, probably was smelly, probably kind of dirty, and this is a pretty good physical challenge for these four men to carry this man. He was just uh, dead weight. Must have been some kind of relationship because this man, this paralytic, had some degree of trust uh, in these men. So there was some level of, of relationship in order for them to be able, in order for him to allow them to bring it to Jesus, there was certainly a level of trust. You know, if this man, uh, perhaps he's a paralytic, we don't know if that's quadriplegic, paraplegic, perhaps um, if just his legs were paralyzed, he, he might have been able to drag himself to Jesus, but we see from the scene he still could not have gotten in. But these friends were determined. They wouldn't give up. You know, I try to imagine what it would have been like here. They're carrying this man from wherever he lived on this mat, and, and they're walking through the village, and maybe they round the corner going to the house where they knew Jesus was, and they're just overwhelmed, even dismayed by the sight. There are people everywhere. And at that moment, they realize, hey, we're not going to be able to get to Jesus. It would have been very easy for these friends to, to give up, to say, hey, we, we can't do it, man. We, we tried friend, we're sorry, we really wanted to get you to Jesus, but we can't do it, it's too hard. No, that's not what they did. We read here that they actually went up on the roof. Imagine carrying this man, the, the dead weight, trying to lift this man and get him up on the roof. Back then, the roof of a home was basically beams about three feet apart, and in between the beams, they would fill the void with brush and then put clay and then pack more clay and eventually sod on the top. So what did they do? They climbed up on the roof and they began to dig a hole in the roof. Now that's pretty brazen. I'm sure the homeowner probably wouldn't have been too happy about that. Think about the crowd. They're so packed in there. It's just wall to wall people inside this house. And all of a sudden, someone starts digging through the roof. Well, first of all, dirt and debris is going to fall on your head. That was probably kind of frustrating. Secondly, these people had gathered to hear Jesus teach, and now there's this disruption. You know, I think sometimes today the church doesn't like the disruption that occurs when we bring people to Jesus. Sometimes in some churches there's even a sense of, a, 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 of annoyance. And sometimes those who need to be brought to Jesus who maybe aren't dressed properly or don't smell right, sometimes there's, there's some harsh judgment of those people. In fact, I imagine of the religious people in this crowd, I imagine some of the religious people wondered when they saw this paralytic being lowered through the roof, well, I wonder what his sin was. See, they believed in their day that a lot of times uh, heal, difficulties in health, people needing to be healed, it was because there was sin in their life. And they probably thought about this man, well, I wonder what he did. I wonder how he sinned that caused him to be paralyzed. Probably some of the religious people were quite judgmental. They may have even thought, well, you know what? He made his bed. Let him lie in it. We kind of think that way today sometimes too, don't we? We see a, a drunk or a, a drug addict who's homeless, and we say, well, that, that's his choices that, that caused him to be there. That's what he deserves. We see a young woman who has a child, and she has no husband, and she's on welfare, and we say, well, that's her own fault. We see someone convicted of a, of a crime. We say, well, they deserve to be in prison. In fact, they ought to throw away the key. You know, really our attitude, if we got really, really honest about it, when as religious people, we look at irreligious people who have all kinds of problems and issues in our life, our attitude toward irreligious people is, well, you know, they deserve to burn in hell. So do we. We all deserve that. Well, what these friends did was risky, it's dangerous, certainly not easy, but what they did was 
they put their faith in action. Their faith was accompanied by work. You know, James said it's not enough to say you have faith. Faith without works is dead. They put their faith to work. And look at verse 5. It says, Jesus saw their faith. Now, I don't know if he was talking about just the friends or also the faith of the man. Obviously, it's required faith of all five of them, the four friends and the man, to do what they did. But Jesus said it was their faith that compelled him to action. Do you recognize that your faith can help bring someone to Jesus? Oh, you can't have faith for them. They have to come to faith. But your faith can compel you to do something to bring someone to Jesus so that they have opportunity to receive him as Savior and Lord. It says, Jesus saw their faith and he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. Oh, wait a minute. They brought this man to Jesus for healing. Instead of healing, he gets forgiveness. I imagine if I was one of the four friends, I'd be going, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What, what did he say? You mean we have to carry him back home? We have to carry him off this roof and back home? They didn't come for forgiveness. They came for healing. But the first thing Jesus did was offer forgiveness because that was the man's greatest need. And because... Jesus knew the hearts of that crowd, and so he's removing the stigma for those wondering that this man's sin caused his suffering. Now, let me pause here and say this. Uh, sin is the cause of all of man's suffering. God created a perfect world. There was no pain, no sorrow, no suffering. Adam and Eve never would have died. They never would have gone through the physical experience of, of decay and death of their body if they had not sinned, but we've all sinned. And sin results in suffering. Sin is, is why there's cancer and other kinds of terminal illnesses and disease and wars and, and, and babies dying and drunk drivers killing people and natural disasters. That's all the result of sin. But what Jesus did is he met this man's greatest need first. Did the man need to be healed? Yes, but his greatest need was forgiveness. Because without forgiveness, you have nothing. With it, you have everything because your most important need is right relation with God, not the healing of sin or suffering. Well, it gets pretty interesting then in verse 6 and down through verse 12. These Pharisees are there. They're always looking for a way to judge Jesus. So immediately say, hey, he's blaspheming. Only God can forgive sin. They didn't believe Jesus was God. They didn't believe he was Messiah, the Son of God. And so they said he's blaspheming. Only God can forgive sin. And you'll notice in verse 9, Jesus asked them this question. What's easier to say? If I just say your sins are forgiven, you, you can't see that with the human eye. You can't immediately see that his sins have been forgiven. Only God sees that. On the other hand, from the Pharisees' perspective, it would be pretty difficult for Jesus to say, you're healed, take up your mat and go home. And so, Jesus shows his power and his authority by saying to the man, get up and walk. It's easier to say your sins are forgiven, but let's think about what was actually accomplished. What's easier to do? For Jesus to tell the man to get up and walk just required him to speak a word. For Jesus to forgive the sin of this man cost him his life. But Jesus clearly demonstrated, not only to the Pharisees, but all those gathered there, some who might still doubt or be skeptic, he demonstrated, and the reason he always did miracles and healing was to demonstrate that he was exactly who he claimed to be, and that authenticated the message of the gospel. Well, as Paul Harvey says, here's the rest of the story. Here's what's kind of behind this event that has just happened. There, there are two miracles and two messages. The two miracles were that Jesus forgave the man's sin. That was the greater miracle. And then, of course, the miracle of healing. But there are also two messages to the Pharisees Jesus made clear that he was God, and he came willingly to forgive men of their sin. Again, he didn't do miracles to draw attention to himself, but to authenticate the gospel. And then the second message, and this is one we really need to hear today, the message to those who were gathered who were believers, the message to the church, it's the same message he demonstrated throughout his entire ministry, and that is this, the gospel is more than just the proclamation of good news. The gospel is the demonstration of compassion for those who are hurting. Those who are hurting physically, those who are hurting spiritually, those who are hurting emotionally. 
It's about demonstrating compassion. It's not just speaking the words. And, and we see over and over again in Jesus' ministry his concern for the spiritual and physical needs of the people he dealt with. I mean, think about all those that, that came to Jesus. He healed the sick and the lame and the blind and the leper. He was concerned for those who were poor, for those who were hungry. And I mention that to say this to us today. Sometimes we take the easy way in reaching the world. What's the easy way? Well, we're glad to tell them that God loves them, but we don't want to get too involved in their lives. We don't want to get dirty. We don't want to demonstrate God's love to them. And I think the good news has been stripped of its power today. The reason we don't see people more responsive to the good news is because we're not changing the world because we're not demonstrating the power of the gospel. We're speaking the words, but we're not demonstrating its power. And I think it's very clear from Scripture, we're not called just to declare the gospel, but to demonstrate it. The gospel message is more effective if the demonstration comes first. It's the old saying of, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. When you care for people, you win the right to speak to them. You, you win their ear. And, and the demonstration has to be more than just words. You know what we want to do? We want to just speak a word, tell somebody God loves you, or we want to maybe toss them a track, telling them how to be saved, how to have eternal life. But what about their needs in the here and now? The demonstration's also more than just throwing money at it, and that's something we're guilty of. This church is a very giving church financially. We spend a lot of money on missions, on community ministry, but it can't be just throwing money at it. We, we can give money to help the poor, the homeless, the, 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 the orphan, the widow, the single mom, but it's much easier to give money than it is to reach out, and money giving is not always the best demonstration of the gospel. I remember several years ago, we had sent, uh, we did a lot of work in Peru, and one particular occasion, we sent a team to Peru, and one of their primary ministries that week was working in this, uh, this orphanage or, or school for the disabled, everything from very young children all the way to uh, older adults who were severely disabled. And that week that we were there, it was phenomenal seeing how they ministered not only to the disabled, but they also did a lot of training for the teachers that worked in that school to help them minister more effectively to the physical needs. Well, that trip, um, sending that team in, cost about $30,000, including what the church put in for supplies and, and to help those who went and, and what they personally paid. It was $30,000. And I actually had somebody ask me one time, hey, wouldn't it have been better just to send $30,000 than, than to send this team? I mean, think about all the equipment that could have been bought and, and all the teachers that could have been uh, sent for, for training. There was so much that could be done with the money. The thing is, people needed to see the love of Jesus. And what happened that week, a lot of good things happened in helping those with disability and in training those who worked there. But here's the difference it made in not just sending the money versus sending a team who could demonstrate the love of Jesus, of the 33 teachers in that school, 11 came to faith in Christ that week. And that happened not just because we went in and met needs, it happened because they saw compassion and then they wondered, why would you come so far and why would you do this for us? It's the demonstration of compassion and, and we're called to be like Christ. We're called to model him. Well, what did he do? We see what he did all through his ministry. Do you know when Jesus made his first public declaration that he was the Messiah? You find that in Luke 4. He's in the synagogue and he reads from the Old Testament and then he proclaims, I'm the one. This passage about the Messiah that, that I'm reading for you today, that's me. And in his public declaration that he was the Messiah, he was reading from Isaiah 61. He was reading the prophecy made about him. And Isaiah 61 contains his mission statement. In verse 1, he says this, Yes, I came to proclaim the good news. That was priority. But listen, he also said, I came to bind up the brokenhearted, to free the captives and the oppressed. And he's not just talking about the Roman oppression. Anyone treated unjustly. And I came to restore sight to the blind. What was he saying? I came to proclaim the gospel, but also came to demonstrate the love and compassion of God to the hurting and needy. And here's what we need to understand. God is frustrated with his people, with, with believers. God is frustrated when we ignore the things that are important to his heart. 
In Isaiah chapter 1, there's a, a charge that Isaiah the prophet is leveling against Israel that God is bringing before his rebellious people. Listen to what the charge is against them. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. You have forsaken the Lord. Verse 11, your sacrifices, your, your worship is meaningless. Verse 12, your worship is detestable and evil. Listen to verse 15. I will not answer your prayers because your hands are full of blood. Now, they had not actually murdered anyone, but what he's saying is you've treated the needy and the oppressed unfairly. You have forsaken the people that matter to me. That's what God was saying against his people. Down in verse 17, this is the, what he tells them they have to do to repent and be right with him. He says, do what is right. What is that? Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. What was he saying? It's important to me that people know of my love and compassion for them. That's an important element of the gospel message. Again, in Isaiah 58, he addresses the failure of his people to care for others. You know what he says to him in Isaiah 58? Your fasting won't get my attention. Now, what was fasting? It was an act of worship. It, it was a dedication of themselves to the Lord. He said, you know, you can fast. I don't care how long you fast. I don't care how many meals you miss. I don't care how hungry you are. None of that means anything to me. It won't get my attention. And he tells them this. This is the fasting or this is the acts of worship that I have chosen. Loosen the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, set the oppressed free, break every yoke, share your food with the hungry, provide shelter for the wanderer, clothe the naked, do not turn away from flesh and blood. You know, Jesus made it clear that his ministry was it to proclaim the gospel? Absolutely, that was top priority. But his ministry was not just about speaking forth the truth of the gospel. His ministry was about demonstrating the gospel through our love and compassion for others. These four men whom we will never know, their names will never be known, perhaps we'll meet them when we get to heaven one day. These four men were simply loving their friend, loving their neighbor, getting themselves dirty, doing the hard thing to bring their friend to Jesus. And that's the example, that's a simple example for us today. You know, there's a lot to be done in our culture. There is great need in our culture. And we've got to learn to not just see the physical need, but the spiritual need. The physical is an opportunity. It opens a door to meet the spiritual need. But that's where we've got to start. And the question for us as a body of Christ is, how are we doing? What are we doing to enable people to get to Jesus? That's what we're here for. That, that's what it's all about. What, what are we offering as the body of Christ, not just corporately, but individually, what are we offering that makes a difference in lives, not only now, but for eternity? No, we're not looking just to meet temporal needs. We're looking to meet temporal needs in order to have opportunity to speak to eternal needs. Now, this is where it really comes home for us, individually, not just the church corporately. Listen, individually, you are the church. I am the church. All of us as individual believers make up the body of Christ. And if we don't personally get involved in lives like these four friends, if, if we don't personally care for others, then the church isn't caring for others. Because we're the church and it's our calling. I'm sure all of you listening to me this morning, if you have uh, come to faith in Christ, that happened because somebody cared about you. It may or may not have involved uh, meeting a physical need in your life, but someone cared about you, and, and knowing that you're cared for is the first step to openness in hearing the gospel. You know, we spent uh, the last four weeks talking about neighboring. The reason that's so important for us is that's what enables us to accomplish the mission God has for us. What is our mission? It's the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. Go into all the world. Get the gospel message out there so that people can hear and respond and become disciples, become followers of Christ. But you know what? The Great Commission doesn't work apart from the Great Commandment. The Great Commandment is to love God totally, completely, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We have a calling as the body of Christ to love people. And as we love people, as we get involved and get dirty and do messy things and maybe at times even dangerous things, as we do that and get involved in people's lives, then we have opportunity to tell them about their greatest need and a great Savior. Would you pray with me this morning? 
Father, thank you for this challenge from the Gospel of Mark. God, thank you for these four friends who cared enough. We don't even know that there was a deep friendship here. Maybe it's just an acquaintance, but they cared enough about this man in tremendous need that they were willing to go to a lot of effort and a lot of risk to get this friend to Jesus. God, help us as the church, help us individually as followers of Christ who make up the church to recognize the importance of loving those around us, loving those that you bring across our path, figuring out what we can do to help meet their needs so that they might ask, why are you loving me? Why are you being compassionate? Why are you doing this for me? And we're able to answer because that's what our Savior would do. Father, help us as a body of Christ to understand that our calling is not just to gather week by week to worship and be encouraged. That's, that's important. But our calling is to gather week by week and to worship and to, to be encouraged and be challenged so we can leave this place as a body of Christ and go out into the world where you sent us and make the gospel known. And help us recognize that making the gospel known is most effective. The gospel is demonstrated most effectively by loving and caring for those around us. Father, even this week, would you show us where we can get involved in the life of someone who needs to know you? Come alongside them and be a neighbor, be a friend to them, that we might win the right and the opportunity to speak the message and the truth of the gospel. Father, thank you that someone cared for us, someone spoke the truth to us. Help us to remember that you have blessed us with our salvation in order for us to be a blessing to others. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.